Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Actually, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing. I took uh, I have five kids, and I took four of the kids last night to the Fall Out Boy concert. Fall Out Boy was okay for me, but Wiz Khalifa was an opening act. I'm not sure I can still hear out of this ear. Um, I don't know. Anyway, welcome, and I really appreciate y'all taking your time to, to join this event. I want to thank Next DDS um, for putting this together. It's amazing that y'all have this opportunity to, to do webinars like this and to learn. Uh, when I was in school, I know I sound like a dinosaur, we didn't have this kind of stuff then. So I, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and um, I want to thank Next DDS for putting this stuff together. It's awesome. Shofu, um, a great company we've been working with for many years and um, I want to thank them for sponsoring this event. So um, let's get started. Excellence in digital photography. And I know a lot of you are third and fourth year dental students and you're not really thinking that much about photography. Um, I don't know what you're learning in school. Frankly, most of the schools don't do a very good job with photography. Uh, there's so many other things to learn for your boards and everything. Um, so I understand that. When you get out of school, you'll probably be picking up more of your education um, on things like photography. So again, thank you for coming. Henry Kissinger said this, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So my goal is that you have a plan. I want you to understand what you still need to learn, why you need to learn it, and then how to use it to make your practices better. It's, so it's all about dental school, learning the skills to become a dentist. Now, what I'd like to do is take you to the next level, and that is making your practice as good as it can be, as busy as you can be but also for you to be doing the best work you absolutely can do. Photography to me is what that is centered around. Here's our outline for tonight. We're gonna to talk briefly about what to buy. We're gonna talk about how to use it then. And then I'm gonna put it all together, I hope, in a little package about doing better dentistry. So again, I can't spend a lot of time on all of these, but just an introduction. I want you to understand that there's a lot of reasons to become good at photography, a whole lot of reasons. Obviously, you're going to get more patients. Our marketing these days centers around photography. Uh, we'll talk about the website and other ways to use your photos to grow your practice. Next, case acceptance. There's no reason to be a great dentist. There's no reason to have great hands and, and go through dental school if your patients won't say yes to your treatment plans. And so it's all about the photography on getting that to happen for you. Next is increased clinical quality. Right now in dental school, I want you to understand that you're just learning, but it doesn't stop after dental school. I've been in practice 26 years, and it's 26 more years of learning. You know what? That's the fun part, because every day I get to challenge myself and try to become better at what I do. Next, it says fewer disappointments, and what I mean by that is one of the things that stresses some dentists out is clinical failure. We have to understand that all of our work isn't perfect and nor does it last forever. So my goal is to have you evaluate your own work so that you have fewer disappointments clinically because that provides less stress, which is the next one on there. All of that wrapped together provides better dentistry for you and your patients. That's what it's all about. I am a nobody and I really seriously, honestly mean that. I am an everyday dentist like most all of you are going to be. It's true, I've been um, given some opportunities uh, to teach. I am the, one of the directors for the Pacific Aesthetic Continuum where we do hands-on courses for full mouth reconstructions and aesthetic stuff. I evaluate products for a lot of companies. I've been published, I think it was our 56th article just recently. Um, I'm very lucky. I've been blessed with a great staff, a great office. And the last sentence in red is the most important. I have no credibility with my staff, kids, or wife. So they still think that sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. So at least tonight I want to give you an idea that I have an idea on photography. I've been teaching photography for years, um, and so I'm going to share with you a few things. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, right in the center of the country. And as you know, we have a baseball team. Cardinals right now have the best record in baseball. Um, who are we second to in world championships? I know you know this. Of course, it's the Yankees. Um, anyway, um, Cardinals are a big part of St. Louis. Missouri is the inbreeding and meth capital of the world. I want you to understand where I'm coming from. So again, my view, the way I look at it is if I can do what I do in St. Louis County, Missouri, I know you can do at least that much wherever it is you end up. I think that's awesome. 
The, the website looks like this. I'm going to show it to you now for the first time for two reasons. Number one, I want you to understand that the photography is what our website is built on. So when we talk about marketing in a few minutes, I want you to remember what you're seeing here, and that is few words but lots of photos. And if you look at the statistics on a website, people visit pages and they stay on the ones that have the best photography. They don't necessarily stay longer on more words. So again, it's about the photography. The second reason I'm pointing out the website at this point is my handouts are on there. And if you want handouts on photography, you would go to eurekasmile.com. And on the page that you see right here, you just click on lectures and course handouts. And you'll see course handouts from courses we teach, including photography. So let's get going on photography, the power of picture. You have to understand why photography is so important first. And it's about emotion, emphasis, educate, and encourage. Emotion is what we're trying to get across to the patients, particularly when we talk about high-end work, cosmetic work, implants, all those things. It's about stirring an emotion inside of a patient that says, yes, I want that treatment. Emphasis is what we refer to um, when we talk about making a treatment plan and then showing a patient why we want them to have the work done that we recommend. Example, if we had a cracked tooth and we want to do a crown on a tooth, it's to emphasize why we think we need, they need the crown. The power of a picture is amazing. Next is to educate. We want to show the patients what we can do, what we've done in the past, and then what it is we plan on doing for them. Next is to encourage them to accept treatment that we've, we've planned for them. So it's a big package of things that we think is real important. When I teach practice management, here is the list of the top eight things that are the best as far as return on investment. So in other words, you're going to be bombarded with ads and magazines that tell you you need to buy everything. A CAT scan, you need digital impressions, you need a milling machine, you're going to need all the expensive gadgets because that's where the ads are in the magazines. If you look at the return on investment of the things you can buy, uh, digital radiographs can't be replaced. Number two is television monitors. I'll show you a little bit about how we do that in a minute. Number three on the list is, a, is an SLR camera, some sort of good clinical camera. You'll see the rest of the things on that list. That little picture on the right there is one of our hygiene rooms. I have a pretty large practice. We have eight operatories. Um, the hygiene rooms all have intraoral cameras. They all have televisions. We have digital impression systems. And I'll kind of explain to you how we set it all up. For instance, this picture here shows you the television. The television we mount on the wall. It's just a Samsung monitor or Vizio monitor um, bought at Walmart. $300, $400, you can get a really nice monitor. The cool thing about monitors today is they have USB ports in the back. That allows you to plug different things into them. On all of our, uh, and on all of our um, televisions in the office, we have plugged into each one of those an intraoral camera. I have digital radiographs that I can show the patient. Example, whenever I take a Panorex, we put it up on the screen. First of all, it lets them see what I took, and then they can diagnose their own problems. Digital radiographs are very important. Look at the photo of the um, x-ray on the bottom right. That's on one of our televisions. Patient had a loose crown. He thought the crown was loose. In fact, it was the entire tooth loose. Can you see the problem on that x-ray? Now, what we would do is show the patient that, and we would point out where the bone is, where the tips of the teeth are, and we would have them look at that and say, do you see a tooth there that looks different than the rest of them? And of course, it's obvious. The power of a picture, it's pretty amazing. Um, so, again, those two things are very important. Intraoral camera onto the television, digital radiographs onto the television, and then patient education software. If you have one of the, there's many programs out there that allow you to educate patients on everything from implants, scaling, root planning, periodontal disease. Those are very important. And the reason they're important is we call them time fillers. So if my hygienist finishes an exam, or excuse me, finishes a treatment, and she's waiting for me to come in and do an exam, and I'm in a restorative room, we'll put up a patient education software on the television. So instead of watching the Oprah Winfrey show or ESPN, for a few minutes there, we have a captive audience. We're going to show them something on implants, something on veneer, something on ortho, that kind of thing, the power of a picture. Patient education software, very important. And then next is the 35 millimeter camera. I'll explain to you how we do that in just a few minutes. As far as intraoral cameras, we get asked a lot about them. 
we think they're awesome, especially in the hygiene room. And the reason they're awesome in there is because they're very fast. It's very easy for the hygienist to grab a wand and take some photos, put it into the patient record. Interall cameras work extremely well for that. The reason you have to go beyond that is because with clinical dentistry, with marketing, with lab communication, with patient education, we need something better. And that's where the 35 millimeter camera comes into play. If you're going to buy an intraoral camera, those are the factors that we feel are important with them. We need something that's anti-fog. You put it in the patient's mouth, you want a crystal clear image. Next, you want autofocus. You won't have to be turning anything to make it focus. We want LED lights on it, USB connection. It has to be ergonomic and lightweight, feel good in your hand. Let's do a couple of examples. This dude walks into my office. This is a typical Missouri patient, of course. And he says, I'm getting hitched in a few weeks, doc. I want to bleach my teeth. Really? That's not really what you need here. There's way too much ugly to fix with bleaching. So anyway, we wouldn't say that to him, but we put his photos up on the television. And patients are used to seeing themselves in a mirror. But you put them up on a 35-inch monitor and show them close up what their teeth look like. It's very dramatic. They didn't realize how bad they look sometimes. Example, we'll be working on a tooth sometimes. We'll take out an old amalgam. We had planned to do a large filling on this tooth, and we'll all of a sudden sit the patient up in the chair, take a photo, put it on the television and say, do you see the crack running down both sides of the teeth here? One running from left to right. For you and me, that's mesial and distal. One running from top to bottom. That's buccal to lingual. And we'll explain to them that this is why you're having pain when you bite on the tooth. You may need a root canal someday, but for now we think the best thing to do is instead of a filling, let's hold the cracks together by doing what we call a crown. And then we explain what a crown is to them. We call that dwelling on the ugly. Sometimes you'll put caries indicator into the tooth and it'll show up the crack even better. Put your caries indicator on the tooth. We like Sable Seek from Ultranap. We rinse it off for a while and the caries indicator highlights the crack form. It just helps the patient focus more on what you're trying to show them. You take your ugliest photo, for instance, if a hygienist took a photo of a cracked tooth and they were waiting for you to come in for an exam and we put the cracked tooth up on the television, the tooth almost starts hurting the patient before I walk into the room. That's kind of cool. It's the power of suggestion, the power of a photo. Very important. For instance, patient comes in carrying a crown in their hand and says, why can't you just stick it back in there? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because there's no tooth left to grab. Show them a picture why. Instant credibility. We'll take a photograph of this case. A patient comes in and he thought he just chipped some porcelain off of an older bridge. We say, no, you need a new bridge. They think that you're just trying to upsell them, kind of upsizing like, like, um, like uh, McDonald's does. But no, we take a picture of it. We show them the, the bridge is actually fractured. It, then it's easy for them to accept the treatment plan because they can see what you see then. The camera is incredible for this. It takes the time away from me. In other words, if I take a photo or my staff takes a photo, puts it up on the television, I don't really have to sell dentistry. I come in the room, they see what the problem is, I co-diagnose it with them, and then it's very easy for us to get the treatment plan accepted. 35 millimeter cameras have changed with time. There's a lot of different ones on the market. We have a bunch of them because we teach photography. There are several that we use in the office. This is the one that you see on the screen here. Notice there's no large flash module on top of the, tel on top of the camera anymore. And the flash these days on a lot of these cameras is wireless. But still, this is kind of a beefy, heavy camera. There, it takes some practice. It takes some skill. Um, you know, it weighs a couple of pounds. Very good to use for certain things. However, no matter what kind of camera you buy, it doesn't matter how good it is if you or your staff won't use it. So despite the fact that I do a lot of my publishing with cameras like this, in everyday practice, you may not want to, to have a camera like this. And the reason is, is because they're heavy, uh, they're cumbersome, they're settings to play with. It takes quite a while to learn how to use them. I'm not saying you can't learn how to use them. I'm just saying that the learning curve is there. So we might want to start out with something simpler. But I want you to remember this. I want you to buy equipment that's proportional to the quality of work you do. So if you do great work, you want to buy a nice camera system, something that captures the meticulous detail that you put into a tooth. If your margins are terrible, your shades never match, your crown and bridge are, is, is not very good, 
then you want to buy a little point and shoot camera that overexposes everything. That'll hide your work. I'm just kidding, of course. My goal for you is to do great work and then capture that detail with a good camera. In this case here, you'll notice that the lenses have changed with time. With time, the lenses have gotten smaller. The one on the right is a 105 millimeter Nikon lens. Canon sells the same version in a 100 millimeter lens. They're big and heavy and bulky. The one to the left in that picture is an 85 millimeter lens. So now we're getting smaller and we're getting the same quality, if not better. So in other words, things change with time. We teach our staff to take the photos for a lot of things. Our staff takes the photos for all ortho patients, for all initial exam patients, for documentation for insurance. And I forgot that one. That's very important because these days insurance companies don't trust us very much. They want documentation for everything. Nothing better than a good clinical photograph to show them a crack in a tooth, a leaking margin on a restoration. And if you have an old PFM crown and it has recurrent decay around the margin, an x-ray may not show that because the metal might obscure that leaking margin. But a photograph that's taken well will show them very easily what they miss. Again, so again, just trying to show you what's coming up next. Things change with time, remember. You know, 10 years ago, there were Steve Jobs, Bob Hope, and Johnny Cash, and they've all passed away now. Now we have no jobs, no hope, and no cash. The economy's not very good still in Missouri. So wherever it is you go, I'm, I'm hoping for you that the economy is going to be better. I'm, I'm trusting that it will. Still, though, we're very busy. And one of the reasons we're very busy is the photography. It helps credibility. When a patient walks into my office, they see what we can do. Our pictures are all over the walls. We show them our uh, before and after cases. They've already seen our website. Um, they know what's coming because they've already kind of met me from our website and our, our photographs before they even see me. So what do you need to buy? First thing you have to have is a camera, retractors. You need something to warm up water in, some mirrors, a contraster, and a background. We'll go through these as we go. Whenever you do photography, the key is to be organized. So in our case, what we do is we have one drawer in a central area of our office that has our shade guides in it, our retractors, our black contraster. And all a black contraster does is it goes behind the front teeth, and we use it mainly for picking shades. And the reason we do that is that when we light up a tooth from the front with a flash, we don't want the bounce flash from the soft palette lighting the tooth up from behind. That's not natural. So we use something black behind the tooth, and that makes our shade uh, capturing much, much better. Notice there's a microwave there with a little cup in it. It's a little um, thermal cup, if you will. We put a couple inches of water in it, and then we put it in the microwave for about 25 seconds, 30 seconds, just to warm up the water. And inside that water cup goes the mirror and the retractors. Retractors that are wet slide in easier, and so it's less discomfort on the patient. And of course, a warm, wet mirror that we dry off, a warm mirror keeps from fogging when you take the photos. So I just want you to understand, I want you to be organized, be consistent, and it takes some practice. Now, which camera to buy? Gosh, there's so many choices out there. Nikon and Canon rule the market. Um, and if you look at the Super Bowl and the hundreds of photographers at the Super Bowl, um, the white lenses are Canon lenses. The black lenses you see on the sidelines are Nikon lenses for the most part. Those two cam camera companies dominate the market. They're both terrific, no question about it. To buy a good camera with a quality lens and a quality flash, like some of the ones that we have in the office, you're looking at spending um, probably around $3,000. It depends on which model you get, of course, and how the setup is to be. Um, but again, it's an investment, no question about it. What I think you might consider to start out with, and it'll make the learning curve so much easier for you, plus your staff will learn to take these photos right away. This is a 35 millimeter camera from Shofu. It's the iSpecial. It's a fantastic camera. The reason it's fantastic is because it's light. You don't have to worry about a bunch of settings. In fact, on the back of the camera is an LED screen, and all you do is pick what mode you want to shoot in. Um, it's made for dentistry. It's very light. It's somewhat waterproof. Um, and I don't want to tell anybody from Shofu this, but we've actually dropped it and it still worked fine. I'm not telling you to do that. But it's a touch screen in the back, uh, very good for images, easy to capture detail. Um, it's a terrific place to start. 
When you look at the camera side by side, um, it looks like this. So the footprint or the size of the Shofu camera is much, much smaller. Again, it's a great place to get started. In fact, it's a great place to continue in your practice, especially if your staff's taking your photos. Whenever you look at the photos, um, I want you to notice there's a difference. There's no question about it. So on the left is a Nikon D7100. On the right is the Shofu iSpecial. Again, I'm just showing you that there are some differences, but the quality is excellent. So the Nikon camera, if you notice on the left, a little bit redder of photos. On the right, a little bit browner of photos. Now we can tweak either one of these cameras to make them almost identical. But I'm just showing you that the quality you get from either camera is excellent. And so again, good place to start, easy to, um, easy to train the staff with, very light, super simple. The reason to have a camera, there's a lot of good reasons, but let me point out one of them to you. We took our kids um, to Costa Rica a few years ago on a little safari kind of thing. I noticed a sign on the tree that said St. Louis, Missouri. You got to have a camera with you because you never know what's going to happen. Here's a little monkey. I think it's a spider monkey. It's sitting on uh, Chandler's uh, shoulder on the left bottom picture. And notice Mallory on the bottom right. She's got her sunglasses on. Cute little monkey. There's reasons to have a camera. As soon as I'm getting ready to press the shutter button to take a photo of that cute little monkey on her, the monkey grabs her glasses. This is an action photo exactly as it happened. Do you see the monkey holding her glasses, jumping into the tree? Here's the monkey up in the tree holding her glasses. It's about 30 feet tall and some kind of wild tree from down there. Um, anyway, no worries. She gets her glasses back. Again, there's lots of reasons to have photos. Um, one of the things I want to stress to you is you never get a second chance to take pre-op photos. So any case that you're not sure about, you want to consult with another dentist, you want to consult with the lab, taking photos is the way to go. Very important. I'm looking at some, some of the questions you're asking um, at the bottom as well. I want you to understand that when you have a busy practice, you're going to need to train your team to take photos. The reason you're going to need to train them is, frankly, you won't have time. And I hope you don't have time. I want you to be so busy that your staff needs to. Frankly, there's always one of the ladies on almost any staff that loves playing with photography. Again, with the Shofu camera, it's very easy to teach them, um, and they kind of have fun with it. The cameras, no matter which one, you have to practice. And what you have to practice is positioning of the patient, holding the retractors, where do you put the mirror, how do you use the contraster. More important than any of that, though, is being consistent in the images that you take. So again, I can't stress this. One of the things I regret about my early photography 26 years ago is, is that my images don't look the same as they do now. And what I mean by that is the positioning of the patient, positioning of my camera, the way I zoomed in, all those things are a little bit different. I wish I would have been more consistent. So we're going to start you off the right way. First thing I want you to do is learn about the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. The American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, or AECD, has a series of 12 photos that they use to do what we call accreditation. That is the pinnacle of cosmetic dentistry. I know you don't understand exactly what that is yet. You have too many other things to think about. Just pointing you to the future, and that is, is learn what these series of photos are. They're excellent. It's a good way to evaluate your work. Probably, though, there's one problem with this series that you need to know. It's not really sufficient for the cosmetic practice. Well, that's crazy. American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, not sufficient for a cosmetic practice? And not really. There's a couple reasons it's not. Look at the headshot there. The top of her head's cut off. That's not very emotional on a website. Here's the orthodontics series by the American Association of Orthodontists. This is also on the Invisalign website and other orthodontic websites. Notice we have a full headshot here and we have teeth in occlusion. The teeth in the AACD series that I showed you previously, the teeth are apart. And the reason they're apart in those photos is so that we can evaluate incisal translucency. However, documentation of occlusion is very important. So I need you to learn these photos, and that is to use a retractor on one side, a mirror on the other, and get good images of the occlusion. Learn how to take them. It's really simple, to be honest with you. Your staff can do it. So if you put both series together, here's what you get. Both series together, the ACD series on the left, the orthodontic series on the right, Again, if you put them together and made a series that we feel is more comprehensive, this is what it would look like. Now, I'm not telling you you have to do these photos. I'm not telling you 
there's a lot of people teaching photography out there. I want you to come up with your own system, but the key for me is is that you have enough photos to really document the case in case something goes haywire on you later. Secondly, I want you to be consistent with your photos throughout the rest of your career. Now's the time to start. Here's a, here's a photographic series that we use on almost every case. The AACD series on the left, the occlusion series, and the full headshot on the right. Everything you need is in there. Pay attention to detail because detail is where it's at. Your angles, the way you retract, how you hold the mirrors, how you position the patient, all very, very important. Now notice the kids in this picture. No, it's not one of my kids, but the kid on the lower in the front row to the left down there. Um, pay attention to detail. Things happen. The dental office. So let's talk a little bit about marketing and about planning for your success because I want you to be successful. Dental office is a business. It is an organization. You have to analyze how you do things to make it uh, profitable. And yes, it is a profession, but it still is a business. We want you to be profitable at the same time. Marketing centers around the photographs. Let's take a look quickly at that same website I showed you before. Let's stress that photos over words are the key. More photos, less words. All you do with the words is explain the photos. Number two on your website development, smartphone friendly. You have to be able to hold up your iPhone and it has to be able to fit on that platform. The third thing on there is I want you to develop a theme someday for your office, a color, a style, a symbol, a logo, whatever it is, and keep that in mind throughout all of your marketing. When you look at our portfolio, you'll see a lot of different cases, um, before and afters. There's a lot of images on here that are just portraits, if you will. The portrait is what is the emotional connection to the patient. Of course, we show close-up photos, too, of before and afters. In this case is a veneer case, and on the left I explain what veneers are. Those kinds of things are important, but that's not where we get our, our big cases from. Our cases come in, frankly, because they compared me to the dentist down the street and looked at our gallery. They looked at our photos. The gallery is what separates my office from the other guy down the street. He may be a better dentist than me. To be honest with you, it matters little as far as getting the patient into the office. What matters there is that they're impressed with what they see on the internet. Today, especially with social media and all, what we want to do is make sure that our gallery, our photos are top notch and better than anyone else in our market. The best way to get a good photograph on a woman is easy. Ladies just naturally take great, it's easy to get a great photo, relaxed smile, and a lady. All you have to do is get a background behind them, and there's all kinds of ways to do backgrounds. We usually do it in the treatment room at the chair, and we just have them smile. The big phrase that we use is turn or tip something. For instance, this lady staring straight at me in this case on the left, that's a pre-op obviously, and I just have them smile. I stand up in front of them. They're sitting in the dental chair. All the photos you see on my website and in this course here are all taken in the operatory in the dental chair. I do not have a portrait studio. Excuse me. I do have a portrait studio, but I don't use it anymore. I have all the fancy equipment, but it works just as well at the dental operatory. Dental operatory, generally speaking, is 8 or 9 feet by 10 or 11 feet. That's the perfect distance for photographs. The cameras that I've showed you already do great for, for portraits like this from five to six feet away. That's perfect because when a patient's sitting in the chair and you go to the end of the operatory, you're five or six feet away from the patient's head. Perfect. We get the top of the head down to the shoulders. Easy to get a lady to relax. You just say, turn or tip something. They don't even know what that means. They're going to be saying, what? What's that mean? And we just say, turn or tip something. They'll turn their head. They'll tip something. Their hair will fall. That's perfect then have them smile. Tell them a joke if you want, whatever. But you want a nice, relaxed photo. Guys, it's harder. Guys, it's tougher. Sometimes we'll have a guy get out of the chair and we have them lean against something. Guys do better when they're standing up leaning against a counter. We'll tell them to put their hand on the counter and lean on it and then look at me and smile. This, one of my staff members will get behind me, do something stupid. Then we can get uh, a good photo of the guys. Again, the key is to be consistent with your, your images. For instance, in this case, a close-up smile and a side view of the smile, very, very important in case documentation, evaluation of your work, and to send the patient after treatment to let them know what you did. Those are close-up of veneers on this case. 
It's all about becoming a better dentist, enhancing the aesthetic eye. Question on here is what kind of uh, consent form do we get when we take photos? You need consent. We slip the first one by them, kind of sneaky, not really, but on their health history, there's a paragraph on there that says, I'm allowing Dr. Griffin and his associates to photograph my teeth and my face to be used in clinical and educational settings. They always sign that. In 26 years, I've never had somebody not sign that. Now, you don't want to use that only if you're going to put the patient's face on your website or on your office walls. You want a separate form for that. And what it does is allow us to use their photograph. Tell them what you're going to do with it and be specific. I'm going to put it on my website. To be honest with you, most of the patients who have had cosmetic work, they're kind of proud to be on there. Some of them won't do it. That's fine. But you'll find out that a lot of them will. Um, anyway, so you need consent for sure. Um, I have consent forms, and if you email me afterwards, I can have someone send one to you. I think they might be on our website in one of the handouts as well, though. Now let's take a little bit of a different approach. We don't have a whole lot of time left. We're going to enhance your dentistry, and I want you to understand how we use photographs to become better clinical dentistry. So here you are in school, and you want to impress your teachers. You want to do a good job there. Let's use photographs to do that. First of all, back to the efficiency. When I do a new patient exam, my staff has for me all my photography stuff, just as if you would have a mouth mirror and explore. Of course, we have that as well, but the photographs we do first. We always ask the patient, can we get some photos? I want you to see what I see. So, for instance, on a consult, the first thing I'm going to show them is their bite. In this case, I explain to them what a crossbite is. Can you see that the one side of your teeth don't line up the same way as the other side? Be simple with it. Use small words, but use the photos. The consult is used to spark an interest. When you do a consult, I want you to listen well to the patient. Actively listen. Think about what they're demanding. Think about their expectations. Look them in the eye and make sure you are relating to them. Scrutinize them while they're talking, though, and try to figure out, is this going to be a picky patient, a demanding patient, somebody that I can please, somebody that I can't please, and make sure you make notes about that. Use your photographs to make a point. Again, we call it dwelling on the ugly. For instance, if your point in this case is to show the patient that you want to fix their crossbite, we would leave a photo of the crossbite up there. And while the assistant's making the treatment plan, we leave that photo up there. So now they have about five minutes to stare at that photo while the assistant's making the treatment plan. Dwelling on the ugly is what we call that. And then we explain simply what we're going to do. Again, photos also sell yourself, have a portfolio in the office on PowerPoint, or you guys are better at this digital stuff than I am, um, but all, in fact, my kids are better at than I am. Have a portfolio, a gallery of digital photos in your office that you can easily put up on the television and show the patient what it is you want to, want to do for them. Example, this dude walks in. Uh, he says, gosh, you know, I think I need to bleach my teeth, and I think I need to do some fillings. And we are like, really? Okay, so I think there's more than that. So we're going to show you, show him what it is that we see. So I, we talk to the patient. We put his photo. We take the photos. It takes maybe three, four minutes to take the photos. We put a memory stick into our office computer, and it's the same computer we have our digital radiographs on. We plug it in. We hit the remote control on the input on the TV. We pull up our, our video. And here's his pictures up on the large TV in, each, in, the, in the operatory. Now it's easy to point out things to him. Show him what it is that we need to do. We always ask the patient, for instance, in this case, do you grind your teeth? No, I don't grind my teeth. Of course not. They always say they don't. So it's about showing them the evidence that we see and why we want to do what we want to do. Um, there's a question on there about do, uh, what do we do for a large case? How do we do tough cases? This is how we do it. If a patient comes in and needs comprehensive work, for instance, in this case, I've taken those photos and I've done a consult with him, and then before I start the case, I want to make sure he understands what it is I want to do. The screenshot that you see right here are the exact photos I took on this case um, before, we, before he accepted treatment. He didn't even know what he needed. Um, this was a, um, a GERD case, an esophageal reflux case with grinding, and it ended up being a full mouth reconstruction case just from those photos. Funny thing is, he had been to several dentists first. For some other reason, he picked our office, and we're a long way from where he lives. 
Uh, after we did the case, he was very clear to us. It was our presentation. Very important for these cases. Dwelling on the ugly. While the assistant's making a treatment plan on the picture on the right, we leave that photo up in the treatment room. Gives him a chance to look at it. He's feeling his teeth. He's, he's looking at his phone. In fact, he's taking selfies, looking at his pictures. Wow, I really don't look very good. Then before we do the case, we do a workup appointment where we take photographs, we mount some models, and I take a full series of photos. It's the very photos I showed you a minute ago. Look at those photos. There's a bunch of them. It's the same ones I showed you. We're very consistent on what we did. Now for the consult, my staff took all those photos. For case documentation for a big case like this, I took those photos. So that'll give you an idea on who did what. But I also want you to remember um, that I want you to take photos that hit the needs of the case. For instance, in this case, we have an attrition case, a GERD case, dark teeth, and very short teeth. So guess what I photograph? I photograph those things. It's amazing, amazing how patients will forget how ugly they were when you started treatment. Um, they forget. They get amnesia. You'll do a case for them and they'll say, well, you know, that's not the color I wanted or, heck, I was lighter than that before I started. And we'll say, no, you weren't. We have photos to show you. We'll, we'll show you. We'll remind you how ugly you were. Of course, we don't say it like that. Of course not. In this case, we have short teeth there. We're going to measure his teeth and we communicate that with the lab. In a case like this, again, we're highlighting what it is that we want to fix, what we want to point out to the patient. Then those same photos and uh, alginates of his teeth get sent to the lab, and then we do wax up from those. We do um, um, matrices to make temporaries with, to do mock-ups with. My point to you is this. Not only do we send impressions to the lab like all of you know to do, but we always send a full series of photos. You can't replace it. What it allows the labs, the ceramist or the technician to do is they get to experience the case without being in the operatory. Very, very important. During the case, we also photograph. There's things that we need to photograph on these cases, and I know a lot of you may not understand exactly what we're doing here. For instance, um, with our bite registrations, our alignment guides, we need to make sure we get the cant right and the angle of the teeth right. The midline has to be correct. And we use analyzing rods to get everything parallel and symmetrical with the midline. We photograph those whenever we get those registrations and we send those to the lab. The reason we send those to the lab is so that they can see if I made a mistake or they can see if I messed something up with my cant. Because when we do a case like this, these patients are often the most demanding, pickiest of all the patients. We really don't have a chance to mess them up. On the right, we're going to show the ceramist what color we're trying to cover. Very important that they see exactly what it is that they're trying to cover because there's different opacities of materials. In this case, we have a build-up material on top, which is light, and a dark tooth on the bottom. That's not ideal. Ideally, we'd have one opacity, one hue, one value all the way through the prep, but sometimes we don't. So we're going to show the ceramist what it is that we have to take pictures of. And the reason in today's aesthetic world um, all of you know about zirconia and lithium disilicate crowns, or Emacs. Um, they come in different opacities, and we want to use the most translucent material we can to cover the color we're trying to cover. So very important that we understand that. Um, marketing. So on the next step. So we've covered the consult, case documentation, lab communication. Let's talk about marketing. After the case, for instance, in this case, we're going to email the photos that we took to the patient. Now, not all of them, just a few of them. My front desk does this. All she's going to do is send them a few of these. It's amazing. It doesn't have to be a perfect case. You don't have to like the color. He does. But he's going to show his family. He's going to show his friends. Um, and then hopefully he refers anybody else he knows that's ugly into our office. And then we're going to hopefully fix them up. We thank the patient for doing, uh, for referring patients. And again, after we finish the case, we get our final photos a few weeks after we cement something like this and then we send them to him by email, and then we let him know that we're proud of him for picking us to, or we thank him for picking, uh, picking us to do the work. We're proud of him for continuing through treatment, and we want to thank him for his ongoing support by referring his friends and family. It's a different way of looking at things. Again, for a consult, I apologize why that's blurry. I don't know why. That was an uploading problem. Trust me, those photos aren't blurry. Um, but anyway, on a consult, these are the photos that we took. On a consult, we often get asked, how many teeth do we want to treat? 
Well, it, we count. We start in the midline and we count back one, two, three, four, five, and back to the implant, uh, number six. So if you want to change the color of your teeth in this case, we're going to do at least six teeth on each side. Again, it's just another way of pointing out what it is that the patient doesn't often think about. Again, case documentation. This is just another example of what we do. Here's the photos we did to document the case. To prevent patient amnesia, I'm going to remind the patient what color they were when we started. During treatment, again, I'm going to communicate with the lab what color the preparations are and did I reduce enough according to our reduction guide. And if you don't know what a reduction guide is, we make a silicone matrix off of the wax up. And then as I prep the tooth, I just try it in to make sure I have adequate reduction on all this stuff. Then after the case, of course, we send the patient the photos. The marketing thing, again, is very important. Now, really, the last thing I want to cover in this section is self-evaluation. After we cement a case like this, the veneer case that you just saw, I evaluate myself. Did I do a good job with the, with the color? Did I do a good job cementing? Do the gums look healthy? Um, did I use enough translucency? Is my, uh, did the lab do a good job with their embrasures? Uh, there's all kinds of things. And on the right are a list of things that the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry uses to evaluate cases like this. And I evaluate myself. I evaluate every single case I do daily. One of the things that we do with photography that perhaps you haven't thought about is what we call the photographic blueprint. And what we mean by that is I never go into a treatment room to do a large case without a bunch of photos in there. I print the photos, I make marks on the photos, and it gives me an idea on what work I'm going to do. For instance, in this case here, I want to do some gingival recontouring. I made the outlines of the gingiva that I'd like to recontour it to in green on the, on the photo. The midline mark is in blue. She has a canted midline that's off a little bit. I made a blue mark where I want to make that correction. So in other words, when I prep the case, it gives me an idea to keep me on task and organized throughout treatment. Now, you don't have to print the photos. You certainly could leave them digital, make some digital marks on them, and put them on your operatory monitor. What I'm just trying to stress to you is don't just wing it in the operatory. Have a photographic blueprint so you know what's going on. Number one, you'll be a better dentist. Number two, you'll be faster. It'll keep you on task and reminding you what it is you need to do. The last area I'm going to cover is a little bit of composite work and how we do composites. Again, on a consult, I might see this. The patient would come in and she says, I've got this old composite on a front tooth. I just don't like the photo. I just don't like the way it looks in photos. I don't like the wear anymore. It's ugly to me. The first thing I'm going to do is take a photo. Uh, my assistant's going to try on shades on the tooth. I'm going to take one close-up photo and look at the teeth in my dark consult room, the very room that I'm teaching, teaching from right now. I turn the lights down low. I have a very large monitor in my room. I put one photograph up on the TV and look at it. It's amazing what you see in a tooth when the distractions of the gums, when the distractions of the room, when the distractions of the staff are out of the way. You look at the teeth and they're not just one color anymore, and I know you know that, but to emphasize that and to help me pick shades, I look at photos while my staff tries on shades. So look in this photo. She's trying on opacities, dentin shades, uh, enamel shades, incisal translucency, different colors. She's picking what she thinks is going to work while I'm looking at the photos. The reason I look at the photos gives me an idea of what kind of mammal on development, what kind of dentin opacity, what kind of enamel opacity. I'm going to use. It just keeps me on task. On an appointment like this, to do that restoration, it took me about 20 minutes because I had a plan going in. The next thing is, after I did the restoration, look at that. It didn't look very good, did it? I took one more photo. I go back to my operatory. It takes me two minutes to load it on to my computer in my consult room, and I look at the work I did, and I say, you know what? Gosh, I'm not very good. I left the one part bulky. I have poor anatomy in one part. My embrasure's not very good. I run back to the treatment room and I enhance it. All I do is polish it, shape it according to what I saw in the photo. Self-critique. That's how we become better. That's our final result there. With composite veneers, it's the same way. The hardest thing to do in dentistry are composite veneers. Example, I'll place my composite veneers. I'll take a photo to evaluate my work and sometimes it's kind of embarrassing how bad I was. And then I print the photos, I take them back to the operatory, and I enhance my restorations. Now, it can be on that same appointment that you placed them, or it can be an appointment the next week. 
Usually in a composite veneer case, I'm tired of working on the case. I've spent two hours doing 10 composite veneers. I'm tired of the case. I let the patient go home. I have them back the next week for what we call an enhancement appointment. And on that appointment, I have, I've had time to evaluate the photos, make some marks on what I want to do to correct things, and then I make my enhancements by shaping, polishing, adding, whatever it is. Again, so I want to stress to you that photography is so important. We've covered some different areas that I think it's very important to understand. I want you to buy quality equipment. I showed you several different cameras. I think starting with a camera like the Shofu camera is fantastic. You may work your way up to some other cameras that take a little bit better photos, but you may never need those. I use those for, photo, for teaching and publishing. Um, but the key is the second one on there is practice. You have to practice. Take time learning how to put retractors in, how to use mirrors, where to stand. And I wish we had more time to go over that. Um, be consistent with your views. Print the photos that you want to take. Mount them on your operatory wall so you remember exactly what to take each time. And then there's no time like today, even in dental school, to start your portfolio. When I was in dental school, I had my own camera then. I had a 35 millimeter slide camera that we used to take slides with, and I still have them today. Um, it's embarrassing how bad I was in dental school, to be honest with you, uh, but I still have them, so it's kind of interesting.